Hi, I'm Tom Power, and this is Toy Heart, a podcast about bluegrass. Welcome to the first show. I'm really, really excited about this. So uh, if you listened to our preview episode, you would have heard me talk a little bit about me, but just to kind of quickly catch you up, I host a radio show in Canada on Canadian public radio called Q, where I get to interview artists, you know, musicians, actors, painters, the whole thing. And um, I get to talk to them about their lives and, and things that are more important than just maybe the art that they make. I want to know kind of the why of, of the art that they make as opposed to the what. And I think that comes from the fact that when I was growing up in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is an island on the east coast of Canada, a very kind of small island, I was really informed by a guy named Neil Rosenberg because I was really into bluegrass and kind of no one else was. I was 15 years old, very lonely, liking bluegrass. And I found this guy named Neil Rosenberg who was a professor at Memorial University. And he would show me how to play the banjo and then teach me a little bit about why this music exist. And um, I, I've been really interested for a long time in applying the things I've learned through the producers at Q, through my work at Q, to the musicians that I love the most, uh, which are bluegrass musicians. And I'm so excited to be partnering with the bluegrass situation. I'll talk more about them a little bit later on. Um, but to talk to some of these musicians about their lives, some of them kind of for the first time. All right. So episode one, my conversation with Del McCurry of the Del McCurry Band. Del McCurry is to a lot of people, especially if you're not firmly ensconced in the bluegrass world, he is bluegrass music. If you come to bluegrass music through jam bands like Fish, well, Del McCurry was probably your way in. If you come to bluegrass music through songwriters like Steve Earle, well, Del McCurry was probably your way in. And what I find really interesting about him is that he's in some ways this link we have to the early days, the earliest days of bluegrass music, and that he played with Bill Monroe, the guy who ostensibly, and it's important that I say ostensibly, but like invented bluegrass music. So we're backstage at the Grand Ole Opry, which is a trip for me, and you can kind of hear my excitement <laughs> for the first, I don't know, 40 minutes of this interview. Um, we talk about how he got into this music in the first place, about learning to play the banjo, about being replaced as the banjo player by maybe Bill Monroe's second greatest ever banjo player. We talk about his love for this music, what he gets out of it, bringing his, his sons who were also in the room, Ronnie and Rob, into the band. And um, what an open-hearted kindness just exudes from this man. Um, it's, it's hard not to be happy when you're talking to Del McCurry. Though I will say that the story he tells about his time in the military is it, it, just going to blow your mind. So here you go, episode one, recorded backstage at the Opry House. This is Del McCurry. Thanks for thanks for talking to me, man. It's nice to nice to talk to you. <laughs> How's it going? You feel comfortable? Oh yeah. Okay, I good. Feel comfortable. <laughs> so I'll start. I'll start out this way. What's uh, What's your earliest memory of of hearing the Grand Ole Opry? Wow, that would have been my first earliest memories. Probably were. We lived out in the country, you know, in in York County, PA. It's where. I grew up, and, and we had a battery radio. It was, it was a big radio, but uh, I don't know what kind it was. But you could put a six-volt car battery in in it, and you didn't have to use that dry cell thing, you know, a little skinny thing. You, just, you could put a six-volt battery in there, and, and, and it would run off that. And my dad, he would uh, park his car on a hill, and take the battery out on Saturday night and put it in that little old radio, you know, or a big old radio, so we could listen to the Grand Ole Opry. Oh, wow. And saying, welcome to the Grand Ole Opry. You just get set for one big hour of country music and fun, because that's what's heading your way and, right uh, now. With our star, Then he'd uh, take it back out Sunday morning, put it in the car, and roll it off down the hill because we go to church. <laughs> and he'd just start it going down the hill, you know. Yeah. That would have been, it was still been in the 40s, I guess, because uh, I was born in 39. But, you know, it didn't impress me because I think I was too young, you know. You weren't into the into the Opry? I wasn't into anything. <laughs> no, were, 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 you, were, really. were you into music at all? No, I wasn't even into music, not really. I, I, my brother, my older brother, he's nine years older than me. He was already playing then. He was playing guitar and 
play the harmonica, you know, and uh, and of course he learned from my mother to do that, play guitar and and play the harmonica. What does she play on guitar? What kind of songs does she play? Well, she would sing. She would sing the, a lot of the old hymns, you know, out of the, the Baptist hymn book. And she'd also, I remember she sang that Barbara Allen, all 15 verses of it. Wow. She knew them all. Isn't mm-hmm. it funny? That's one I remember because she sang it a lot. But uh, she really didn't have, she didn't have as much time to do, to sing and play to the kids like when when my oldest brother, he was the only one, you know, and he learned a lot from her. But by the time I come along, there was, I was number four. Right. Well, she had too many other things to do in the <laughs> in the house, you know, <laughs> and I didn't get to hear that much. So, were you a musician then of convenience? Was it was it like you know your brother needed someone to play with, so he got That's you to play? Exactly. Yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He kept on me to he wanted me to learn to play the guitar, and uh, well, I I think by then I was interested, and by the time I was nine, though, I was playing uh, the chords on a guitar and rhythm, you know, behind. Uh, him, he could play lead and and uh, and sang. He sang a lot of the old uh, songs that he heard on the opera, you know, like Ernest Tubb. I'm walking the floor over you. I can't sleep a wink. That is true. And Roy Acuff. There's a gal from Tennessee. She's long and she's tall. She came down to Birmingham on the Wabash Cannonball. A uh, Hank Snow. A big eight wheeler rolling down the track means a two loving daddy ain't coming back because I'm moving on. I... Uh, Bill Monroe. Blue moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. Shining on the one that's gone and proved and true. Bill Monroe. He was popular then, and imagine when he was listening, uh, Flat and Scruggs were in the band yet. You know, yeah. When, oh, so like the early... Yeah, when, when he was listening. I, I never really uh, took a, a big interest in it until he bought a record in 1950, and I would have been 11, I guess. And it was rolling in my sweet baby's arms, and uh, uh, took... I really paid attention to Earl's playing. Earl Scruggs, you know, he played so fast and all, all them notes and come. And the backup is what uh, I thought. Man, that's they uh, they did that song "Rolling My Sweet Baby's Arms." That was the record. And on the other side of that was "I'll Just Pretend." And I, man, I wore that record out, you know. And uh, l- like they kicked it off with the they they kicked that song off and they do the chorus "Rolling My Sweet Baby's Arms," rolling. And then when it came to the verse, uh, Lester come in there, I ain't going to work on the railroad, and he went Whoa, down that neck, man. <laughs> yeah. I ain't going to work on the railroad. All the way. <laughs> yeah, right on the top, man. He, was the he coolest, started the eh? third yeah, string. Yeah. He started noting it here and yeah. noted the rest of them yeah. as he was going down, <laughs> you know. sweet baby's arms. sweet baby's They round the shack till the bring them back and roll did you have a banjo then? Like, did you? I had no idea what he was doing. I was like, you? I thought, how's he do that with a pick? I don't see how he can do that, you know? Because <laughs> I, I hadn't seen a three-finger uh, banjo player then yet, but later I did. Later I, I did see him. But I saw Earl, though, in 1955, the first time. Really? Where? At, at a place called um, Valley View Park. Wow. Right just out of York. It was the country music park. Right. And there was a country or there was Valley View Park, and there was Sunset Park, and New River Ranch. That's the three that I we'd go to. What, what do you remember about seeing? It was a Flat and Scruggs. What do you remember about seeing Flat and Scruggs? It was Flat and Scruggs, and boy, I wanted to see him because it hurt him so much on that record. And then on the radio too, they were playing. By that time, they were playing a lot of their stuff on the radio, and they had already quit Bill Monroe, you know, and got their own band about that time, I think. And he, uh, he loved that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I know my my. Now I saw Bill Monroe though in 1950. Wow, first time. So how would would I have been? I would have been. 
11. I was 11. I guess then. that would have been Rudy Lyle, maybe on banjo then? No, I'll tell you what. I couldn't remember the guitar player's name, I, but he had a fiddle player named Joe Meadows with him. And he had this girl bass player, and that was Bessie Lee, which I found out later. And he had a, the banjo player was a guy named Joe Stewart. He was an, he's a utility guy. He can play anything. Yeah. He, he can play fiddle with Bill and banjo. But what he loved to play most was mandolin, but he couldn't do that in that band. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he wanted to do. <laughs> I see a sign of things to come in your life, too, man. You know, I see, I see yeah. a, a foreshadowing of your life in, uh, in Bill Monroe's band, too. Yeah. So, so were, were, you, were you good at the banjo right away? No. It, no, it took me a, well, let's see, when I finally did get one, uh, my dad got a, uh, an old... Uh, Vega, it was it was a cheap one. I guess it might have been a pretty good banjo, but and but it had a good neck in it, and and I played it, you know. And then by the time that I got, see, when I got out of high school, I must have played that thing till I got out of high school, because I got a job and could buy one. I bought a brand new Gibson. Irish top. Uh, yeah. 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 It was a, a Gibson one fifty. And it didn't have a tone ring in it or anything. I didn't know that much about them. They probably had one there that had that in, and I didn't know the difference. Yeah. But later on, then, I traded it for a really good one. I, bought, I traded it for a 1934 uh, 40-hole arch top. Then. Right. And, and, uh, but the first time I saw Bill, he had... So the banjo player was Joe Stewart, and he did comedy. He, he was dressed up in comedian clothes. Yeah. And played, too, you know, at the same time. But it was on top of a refreshment stand at a drive-in theater. My sister was going to go there, and I begged her and begged her and begged her to go. I knew she was probably meeting a boy there, and yeah. she didn't want me around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she had a car, you know. She was five years older than me. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, I got her, and she took me, and, and I saw them up on that refreshment stand, and, and they played in between movies, you know. And the only people... Uh, the, only, the only way people could hear him was uh, through their uh, speakers. It was had hung on the window in mm -hmm. the car, you know. Mm -hmm. So did you want to be a professional musician? Was that... I think I did uh, the whole time. I th Once I heard Earl Scruggs and, and, and got to where I could... I did learn pretty... I'm, I guess I learned pretty fast, you know, for the circumstances. Because <laughs> all we had was records and, and you couldn't hardly see anybody play like like on TV or anything like that. You had to just go. And, and I remember when I saw Earl that first time, I could tell that my role, I was not playing my role like him. Because I could see good, I had really good vision in, and I wasn't sitting that far away from him anyway. And I could tell he was doing that forward role, mm -hmm. you know, when he did that, mm -hmm. mainly. And so I went home and I tried that, and man, you talk about hard. Because my fingers didn't want to go that way. Yeah. Yeah. They had another direction they was wanting to go, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I think it was one, three, two. Right. One, three, two, one, three, two. And, you know, that's, that ain't the right way. But anyway, it didn't take me long. And then once I did it a few times, I could tell it sounded right. You know, it had the right sound. Right. And I played like that. But then there was a boy that came to work there from down in Virginia, uh, that was a good banjo player. Made, he had played with Mac Wiseman. Oh, really? Yeah. My dad had a house that was a, it was an old mill, and uh, it had a, a grist mill in it. It had a sawmill in the house. But my dad took the sawmill out and, all, and made rooms there, and he'd rent them rooms, you know. And this guy, he, he come up there to work, and my brother, oldest brother got to know him, and he... He uh, rented him a room, and and he he played he played good, and I I learned a lot from that guy. Right. I wonder what his name was. He had a forty one Ford convertible. Cool. <laughs> I like that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and every night you take the battery out of it and put it in the radio, and you were fine. That was all good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so then you were you were carrying around playing music. You got you got drafted in sixty two, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Got drafted in sixty two, and. 
then I, I but I I didn't stay in there long. I I went AWOL a couple times yeah. <laughs> with another bunch of guys. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and that don't work, you yeah. know. <laughs> so so this I went through basic several times. I don't know how many times I went through basic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when we see what happened when we get done with basic, then we we could go off the base mm-hmm. and. <laughs> So, <laughs> a bunch of us got this one guy had a '53 Ford there. I don't know, if, I don't know how he had that at the at there, but he did have it there. We all piled in that car and went to Mexico. <laughs> oh, good! <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, man, we never got back till. And when we did get back, you know, uh, don't I think they put us in the stockade? I think they did. Oh my God! I know I spent thirty days in stockade for that. <laughs> really? <laughs> but the next time we did it, then they, you know they they moved us back then with another bunch to start over and go through basic chems eight weeks. Mm-hmm. We went through eight weeks one time, <laughs> started eight weeks again. We yeah. got good at that yeah. basic. <laughs> By the end of it, you could it was basic to you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We could chin with one hand. <laughs> when, when, when we go in the mess hall, there's a bar. There you, and you had to you had to do pull ups you know yeah. on that bar or you couldn't get in there to eat <laughs> and and so I remember that part but anyway then then the next time we done that <laughs> when we got back to the our, our unit you know the the uh, company commander he he called us all in there and, and he told me he said you know. I'm going to let you go home. <laughs> <laughs> You're better off at home, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, this, maybe this isn't going to work I out. I don't know why. Uh, and I told him, I said, well, if you start a war, let me know. I'll come and help you. <laughs> but there ain't shit to do here now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so then you get out. You, I, uh, I was looking it up. Do you ended up playing with, is it Melvin Howell and the Franklin County Boys? Uh, Marvin. Marvin Howell. Yeah, Marvin Howell. And the, he was from Franklin County, Virginia. It's moonshine capital of Virginia. And right. now they argued that, the, that what's that capital in Carolina? That's capital. Wilkes. Wilkes County. <laughs> supposed to be the moonshine capital of the world. Right. But these guys say, no, Franklin County, Virginia is the moonshine <laughs> capital. <laughs> and, of course, he had plenty of that. Fra- uh, Marvin did. Yeah. <laughs> Marvin. He, Good he reason was, to be and, in a band, man. And right he there, was yeah, a banjo yeah. player. Oh, okay. Uh, but, see, before that, I, I played in a band. I played in, with Keith Daniels and the Blue Ridge Ramblers for quite a while. And I know what. I quit. I, I played with him until I went in the Army. But then... When I came back, I got a job with Marvin Howell in Baltimore. He was just doing uh, bars, you know, club work in Baltimore. It was a big town for bluegrass, Baltimore yeah. was. And and I was only uh, probably 40 miles from there. And, and uh, Was it like beer joints and that kind of stuff? That's or? all it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the first band to play Carnegie Hall, first bluegrass band, was playing a little old bar there. And I knew all those guys, Who's you that? know. Uh, that was Earl Taylor and Stony Mountain Boys. Earl Taylor and Stony Mountain Boys, yeah. 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 But anyway, I went down there and was playing with Marvin, played guitar with him. Borrowed uh, Keith's Martin guitar. He had a 50, early 50s Martin, and I borrowed that to play with him because he played banjo. And then uh, then it wasn't long after that, I got a job playing banjo with um, Jack Hook. And he had been with, with Monroe yeah. and with the Clinch Mountain Boys, too, right? He was. He started yeah. with the Clinch Mountain Boys. He played bass with them. Right. He was playing bass with the Stanleys when he got a job playing guitar with Bill. Yeah. And he was a really great guitar player. I mean, bluegrass, you know, he could play runs and rhythm, and his wrist was just as loose, you know, and, and he was a good singer. Oh, And uh, he quit Bill, moved to uh, D.C. to play with the uh, Stoneman family. They had yeah. a TV show there. Yeah. I'd played that with Keith, right. that TV show. And so then he went up to Baltimore and was playing guitar with Earl Taylor. Right. And then he didn't stay long, though. I'd see him all the time, you know. And I went in there one time, and uh, Earl had uh, Jim McCall playing guitar, and I asked 
Jim where Jack was, and he said, he's just playing over right across the street here in a little old bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over there. <laughs> and so uh, I went over there, and uh, I got to talk to Jack, and, and Jack said, you got your banjo with you? And I said, yeah. And he said, bring it in here. And so <laughs> I went in, and I played a little bit in the, actually the tuned up in the kitchen. There wasn't no green room or nothing. <laughs> Tuned up in the kitchen, and I played with it, but and he liked what I'd done, you know. He had a guy with him, and he told me, he said, "Look, can you be here next weekend?" You know, I think he played three or four nights on the weekend. <laughs> I said, "Yeah." He said, "I'm gonna get rid of so and so." I forget the guy's name, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so, so I played with Jack, and, and then that's how I got my job with Monroe. Well, you know? So yeah, can you take me through that? Like so, because I I've heard the recordings of you playing banjo with Bill, and they're very cool, man. I heard oh, live yeah. like live board recordings. I think at like New York University of you playing the Lonesome Road Blues, like yeah, nah, you know. <laughs> but I feel like all anyone focuses on is the story of when Keith got in the band, and I'll and I'll we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, but can you yeah. tell me exactly how you go from Jack Cook? To playing with Bill Monroe, like, to, is it because Bill knew Jack because Jack was in his band? He introduced you. Yes. Uh, what happened uh, one night? We was playing at a little old bar called Chapel Cafe. Where's uh, this? Right in right downtown Baltimore. Okay. You know? and, and we was playing one time, and, and uh, the like the stage was here, and there's a side door right there. It wasn't the front door. It was just, it was, the alley was there, and you could come in that door, and there was a chair right there, and, and it was dark in there except on the stage, you know. And this, I saw this guy walk in and sit down in that chair. He had a big white hat on, and I thought, God, he looks like Bill Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be Bill Monroe. He's in the Grand Ole Opry, you know? Yeah, what, what would he be doing here in a <laughs> yeah. bar like this? Yeah, I understand, right? Yeah. yeah. But I was wondering about this, you know. We finished up our set, and, uh, and Jack, he'd come off the stage like this and went right over and, and talked to him. And then I went in the kitchen where we'd tuned up and he brought Bill in there. You Were know. you a bit intimidated? Were you a bit... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was probably nervous once I found out he was in there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and But anyway, Jack said, B uh, Bill, did you, uh, did, you, did you have a banjo player with you? And he said, no, I don't. He said, let's just take Dale with us. He said, he can do it. And <laughs> I'm surprised that Jack would be okay with that, like losing you as a banjo player. Well, what it was, we were just going to go and, and do this one date with him. Oh, okay. He came up there with Kenny Baker and Bessie. The bass player and the fiddler. Yeah. He he just he knew he could get Jack, and that's all he worried about. He figured Jack could get a banjo player, I guess. I don't know. He he evidently had called Jack, but Jack never mentioned a thing to me about it. And we were just going to do that one date in in, Ball, in uh, New York. So the next day we we went up there, and and I thought, boy, we'll probably rehearse the show and all like that, and. We just tuned up and <laughs> walked out on stage. <laughs> I had no idea what he's going to do, you know? <laughs> I, I heard stories that if you were a banjo player, you had to watch Bill's hand, right? Yeah. From behind to figure out what key he was playing. Or yeah, he would always, when he stepped up to the mic, uh, he would hit a chord, and you had to, you had to catch a chord and see what, and then put a clamp on <laughs> guitar players and banjo players did, you know. Just, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I guess I had my ear tuned pretty well to to a chord, you know, and and, <laughs> and I sang baritone on some stuff. And, and uh, Did you know you were a singer at this point? Had you been singing? Yeah, I had been. So I'd you been, were, yeah. I was singing with Jack, yeah. Okay, cool. It was me and Jack. We had a trio, me and Jack and uh, Kimball Blair was. right. He was the fiddler, and, and we, we had a pretty good trio. And, of course, me and Jack did a lot of duets, too, you mm -hmm. know. And So how does, like, so when you get off stage with Mon uh, with that gig with Jack, does Monroe, yeah. like, kind of poach you? Does he kind of say, like, hey, if you're ever... Because I know, like, Ricky told me a story about him kind of calling people... Well, A, he told me a story about him calling people up and saying, like, hey, do you, ha do you play bass? Do you own a white hat? <laughs> Do you want to come play bass for me tomorrow? Like that was kind of the bass player thing, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. But I also heard he was a little funny. But he didn't, you know, if you were playing with somebody, he was a little nervous about taking you away from somebody you were playing with. Yeah. So, so how did that? How did he end up taking? Saying, "Do you want to come full time?" Well, I'll tell you what happened. We got back to uh, after the show. I guess we got right in the car. We did. He had a '59 Oldsmobile station, Super 88 station wagon, and we got in the car and loaded it up, you know, and. and uh, Started back, and Jack drove, and, and I sit in the back between Kenny and Bill. Monroe's over here, and he's talking to K 
Kenny, and Kenny called him chief. He'd say chief, you know. And so eventually, I was talking about this and that and the other, you know. <laughs> After a while, uh, Bill said, uh, Kenny, what do you think of this boy's banjo playing? And uh, Kenny said, uh, Chief, he's got a wicked right hand. <laughs> I mean, I could play rawhide, right? I could stay right with him on that fast stuff. I've know? heard it, man. It's pretty great, man. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I didn't go out on a limb. I knew, I knew more things to play uh, in them tunes, but I was afraid to branch out any, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> I just stuck to the basics, you know, uh, when when I played that night because, you know, I. I was afraid I'd mess up. So anyway, have you, have you heard any of that? That's all on YouTube. Yeah, now. yeah, it's pretty amazing. You know. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. have. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, who I was in the audience. David Grisman was going to college there. Right. And uh, Peter Wernick. I think. I think that other banjo player. I think was in the audience. Uh, he was uh, Dr. Pete's buddy. They played in the band together. Both of them played banjos. To Tony. Tony Trish. Tony Trish. Tony Trish. I'm talking to him on Friday. Are you really? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty yeah. sure he was in the audience too. Cool, cool. I know they they talked to me, and uh, and and they, you know, they liked what I did. I know, but it was pretty simple what I was doing. I mean, I was <laughs> I knew how to roll. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but you know, when we got back to Baltimore, uh, Bill paid me. And uh, he said, "Now, I tell you what. If you if you want a job, I'll give you a job. You know." And I did. I did, I could have went right night with him back to Nashville, but I like playing with Jack, and I and I really didn't want to leave Jack. You know. I really? Didn't. Yeah. I because he was he's a little older than me. I thought he was my age, but he's a little older than me. And I enjoyed playing with Jack. He's such a good rhythm guy. Even though Bill Monroe was the star of the Grand Ole Opry. Like <laughs> yeah, though, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh-huh. that's, that's loyalty, man. That's, you know, that's, that's and, something and, there, you know. And then I had another buddy that I stayed there and I played with Jack for maybe a month, I don't know. And this other buddy of mine was a banjo player and he said, you know what, a lot of guys are killed for that job. If you go down there, I'll take you in my car <laughs> <laughs> from York to Nashville. And it was Bobby, you know. So how long did you play with, with, with Bill before the other Bill showed up? <laughs> oh, we both. This is the funniest thing. Because I went to Nashville, he told me, he said, now look, if you take a notion to uh, take this job, just come to Nashville and go up on 7th Avenue, this uh, hotel called Clarkson Hotel, mm-hmm. and go in there and get you a room and call me. It seemed like a room was $2.62 a night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then... Bathrooms down the hall. Yeah, right. didn't have none. <laughs> no air condition. Yeah, and uh, that'd be two hundred and sixty-two dollars <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, in this city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I went. I remember I went to there, and uh, I think I called him that night, and, and uh, he, you know he's a man of few words. He's saying that much, and he said, uh, "Yeah, I'll be in. I'll be in there in the morning." Well. He told me what time to be down in the lobby. And I got up and I got ready and all like that and carried my banjo down in the lobby. And when I walked into the lobby, there's another guy walked in the lobby with a banjo. <laughs> and I thought, I'd like to talk to that guy, but didn't have time because Bill walked in right then. <laughs> and and he saw us both. He said, uh, come on, boys, follow me. <laughs> well, we just followed him like two little puppies, you know. <laughs> And he walked right out of there, and right next door was a restaurant, and he took us right in there, and he bought her breakfast. And he didn't say ten words, I don't reckon. He just didn't say nothing. We just sat there and eat. And you, used to and sit, was, you sitting next to this other banjo player. Yeah, yeah. Him not saying anything, eating eggs. Neither one of us. Yeah, right. Good. How comfortable. Good, good job interview. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uncomfortable, man. That's uncomfortable. But that's the way he was. You know, he just had never said anything a lot of times. And of course, we were young, and, and we were both, I know we were both kind of bashful, you know. And so we ate, and he paid for a breakfast. And then he said, now, uh, come on, follow us. Follow me. And we walked right out of there and went into the National Life and Accident Insurance Building and went up in an elevator to a room. And when we got in that room, there's things I remember about it. There was a, a brown guitar case over in the corner. I saw it as soon as we got in that room, you know. And, and uh, 
he told me, he said, Dale, uh, you get that guitar. Well, I thought, well, what kind of deal this is? I, I didn't come down here to play no guitar. You? <laughs> and so I got it out. And Bill Keith told me later, though. And so I played the guitar. And I guess I sung a little something with him. I don't know. And uh, Keith said, well, then he had a switch. He said, he made uh, me play the guitar and you play the banjo. And right. we might have done a trio, too, in the end. And when it was all over, which wasn't long, 15 minutes maybe, he said, uh, now, Dale, I want you to play the guitar. Uh, you'll like that job better. And I thought, yeah, he's just thinking I you know, like it better. <laughs> but I thought, <laughs> well, I can't argue with him. You were, know. You, were you disappointed? I was. I was disappointed. I could play the guitar, but I wasn't really interested in playing the guitar because all I thought about was Earl Scruggs and all this stuff. You know how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I understand that, man, you know? Yeah. So then you, were, you, you didn't want to play the guitar with Bill Monroe, but you couldn't say no because it's Bill Monroe. Yeah, it was. And I thought, well, you know, I'll try it. But you weren't mad at Bill Keith? No, it wasn't, not at all. No. Because he had, I, he was playing things I'd never heard before. Yeah, he's unbelievable. Right you then, know, yeah. you know, right uh, and I thought, man, how's he done some of that? Because he stuff? played that Devil's Dream in those in those early days with you guys. You played know? Devil's Dream and the Sailor's Hornpipe. He played new and different tunes, you know, and and, and I thought, you know, well, this might be good for Bill too, you know, yeah. have this different stuff. What a band that was! I mean, that's that's that was a that was a legendary kind of Monroe era band, right? With Bill Keith yeah, on banjo. Yeah, I think it was you, too. You, you know, singing. Richard Green, I think, was playing fiddle. Was he or no? Still Kenny. Kenny uh, had come in '58, and this is '63. Right. He had come in '50, but he didn't stay the whole time. He told me that he come, quit, and went back to the mines. And by the time I came in, and me and Keith, he had come back again, mm -hmm. and he was playing fiddle. What do, you, what do you remember from that time playing with Monroe? Any, any stories come to mind? Well, let's see, I, I try to remember some stories. Well, we went to, uh, I don't know where all we went in the beginning, but I remember going to California, and that, that was exciting to me because I'd never been there, you know. Yeah. And so we drove that station wagon, went out there, and, and when we got there, he told me and uh, Kenny, he said, now, you boys, you're going to stay with these guys, which I, he mentioned the name. I had no idea who they were. <laughs> and uh, he said, you're going to stay with these guys. Evidently, he talked to this band, the uh, uh, <laughs> the Dillards. <laughs> oh, no way. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when we got there in the, and got situated, here are these guys come. They had a 56 Cadillac. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the mandolin player, there's something wrong with his eyes, you know, what it was now. Yeah. And uh, he was the driver. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> He's a designated driver. Right, right. So, <laughs> so they, they, they come, and I don't know, I don't know if they, I think, I think we stayed in town. Uh, we were playing Ash Grove, and we stayed there, and then when it was all over, they took us home with them. You know, they lived in the Topanga Canyon, and they rented a place up there, and they took us home. And, and they had a little, it was a little sun room, like, in that house that they rented. And it was no bigger than, say, it was, it was big enough to put one bunk here and one bunk here, and then both of them touched the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Good, Kenny good. slept one, I slept another. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, in the morning, that sun come in there, God, and we'd been up all night. <laughs> they, they would uh, jam all night and expect us to stay up and, yeah. and jam with them. And then, well, when that sun come up, you couldn't stay in there very long. <laughs> and then we'd have to go play again that oh night. One time we had it for a week, seven days, I guess. And another, place, another time we played it two weeks. Right. In, in, uh, and... <laughs> Me and Kenny didn't get any sleep at all. We, and those guys that all come, all the bluegrass, because they like to hear Kenny Baker play the fiddle, like the uh, Gosden brothers, uh, Rex and Vern and Don Parmley. They had a band, and uh, and, and and the little guy, Chris Hillman. Chris Hillman, he was just a kid. Yeah. And they all had a band. Well, they'd come over there at night, 
after the <laughs> after we'd played the Ash Grove, and uh, the White Boys, uh, uh, Clarence and Roland, Clarence and Roland, yeah, yeah and, and and Eric. another bunch oh and the dealers that's right there's yeah. three and and they'd all <laughs> we'd stay up all night and play and i remember clarence he'd we all smoked then and clarence he'd duck his ashes in that guitar hole that's he used it as an ashtray yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the world's most expensive ashtray yeah. <laughs> yeah. 1934 d28 yeah 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 it's, it's like using the sphinx you know as an ashtray it's like using that old you know yeah, yeah. ming vase you know <laughs> it's funny the, th the things you remember you yeah know? so what 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 made you decide to leave uh bill well i'll tell you what Kenny eventually quit, and so did Keith. They both quit, Just you know. Hard, hard conditions on the road, hey? Oh, like, yeah, yeah, it was, you know. I was single, and I didn't care, you yeah, know. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and, of course, Keith was, too, but he he didn't he didn't take to the road too well. Keith, Keith didn't. It didn't bother me any, you know. <laughs> and Kenny, he didn't. But Kenny got a job, another job in the mines. And well, this time, he's going to be a superintendent on top. And he didn't have to go on down under. And he said, I've wanted that job all my life. So he quit playing the fiddle with Bill and went back there. And uh, and so I remember soon after both those guys quit, I, I went back to uh, PA. I might have had my car down there then. I had a 57 Chrysler in New York, or you could lay a bass fiddle in the trunk of that thing like this, crossways. I mean, you didn't have to jiggle it around or nothing, just lay it in there like this. Yeah, yeah. And you could do two lanes at once, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and you could pack suitcases all around it and anything, you know? But anyway, uh, he Bill knew I was going to go home for a few days, and he said, uh, now when you get up there to Baltimore, you see if you can't find us a fiddle player. Well... Uh, I thought I'd, I wouldn't find nobody that was good enough, you know. <laughs> but I went, and uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to go back down and see Jack. He's still playing the old Chapel Cafe, you know. And and and, and so I went down to see Jack, and Kent Billy Baker was playing fiddle with Jack. And he's a really a good breakdown fiddler, you know. He wasn't really good on song breaks, but he, he could play it. Some of them he could play. He knew Bill Monroe's stuff, and... Benny Martin things, that's about it, you know. Anyway, uh, I said something to Billy, and I said, you know, Monroe needs a fiddle player, and he said, uh, I'll just go back with you, you know. Well, kind of shocked me. And then we went back, and we played, I don't know how long we we played with Bill then. I see it was Billy and me. Oh, and then he started using uh, twin fiddles on, on the road a little bit. couldn't get along. Twin fiddlers never got along with Bill, you know. Uh, <laughs> he'd tell you that, too. <laughs> so, oh, Roland asked him one time, he said, Bill, why don't you take twin fiddles? You know, it sounds really good, you know. Uh, they can't get along. <laughs> 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 so, and it's true. That, uh, that there guy that went with Billy, I know they couldn't get along. They'd argue about who's playing what and this and that, you know. Uh, it was uh, Benny... Benny Williams. William, Benny Williams. Oh, Benny, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So him and Billy played twin fiddles for a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember we played... Uh, the Newport Folk Festival, and I think they was up there. I think those two went up there. And cool. Anyway, uh, I become good buddies with Billy, you know, Billy Baker. And uh, and I I made a mistake of mentioning uh, that I was offered a job in California with the Golden State Boys. Golden State there. Boys, yeah. And, <laughs> and he kept on me. He said, Let, let's quit Bill and go out there. You know how boys are. And I said, no, I don't want to. I don't. I want to stay here with Bill, you know. Oh no, let's let's go out there. They got TV and all that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was fascinated with California, man. He really yeah. was, and of course I was too. But I didn't want to go out there. Anyway, I said, "Well, look, tell you what I'll do. 
I'll call them up <laughs> and, sit, and, I, and I'll, I'll say, I'm going to ask if I can bring a fiddle player when I come out there. Because they, they wanted me to come. They, they had called me several times to play banjo with them. Mm. It wasn't guitar. It was uh, Poindexter played guitar in the band. He was good. He was a good guitar player, a good lead singer. He was Tony Rice's uncle, his mom's brother. Right. So... Uh, so did you have to did you have to say it to Bill? Did you have to go to him and say, "Hey, man, I'm I'm out." <laughs> what happened was, no, <laughs> it didn't happen that way. <laughs> Keith didn't either. Yeah. I didn't know that. Keith left us out in, in the middle of the two weeks in California. Right, and Jerry was going to do the gig. wasn't Wasn't Jerry there? Jerry Garcia. Well, I learned that later when he took him some banjos to sell him the old ba- banjos, and uh, and uh, Jerry. Uh, he said, you know what? I come see you guys to Ashgrove, mm-hmm. and, and I wanted to be a bluegrass boy, you know? And I said, why didn't you tell us our banjo player quit right in the middle of the... <laughs> and we didn't know anybody out there, you know? Man, imagine that, here, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 He could have come right in there, because yeah. he lived there. Yeah. Sandy uh, Rossman. Yeah. Uh, said he, he, yeah. He yeah, Sandy just did that record with Jesse McReynolds, the, the, yeah. the Robert Hunter Garcia record. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. He said that Jerry's just too shy, you know? He, Jerry told me that. He yeah. said he was he was ashamed to come up and talk to us, you know, and, and and he was out in the audience. But there was a lot of musicians and even actors and stuff would come in that place, you know. And, right. Uh, I remember Roger Miller come in there one night, and and he didn't have no hits yet. He he they, he knew Bill from here. He'd worked here with Ray Price and all, all those guys, and and so Bill got him up, and Bill said, uh, "Dale, give him that guitar." Well, I handed him the guitar. And he walks up to the microphone and he says, Well, folks, I'm going to sing you a song I wrote. And he hits an E chord and starts singing, Some folks like the summertime. (laughs) 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 Put Prince in the snow. (laughs) Some folks like the summertime when they can walk about. Strolling through the meadow green, it's fun, there's no doubt. But give me the wintertime. And that same night, uh, uh, the big the big fiddle player came in there, and he was trying out for Tarzan. <laughs> Gordon Terry. Yes, he had played. He he was Bill's lead fiddler for a long time, right here at the Opry, you know. And and when they'd have three fiddles, Gordon would be the the lead man, you know. And anyway, he told me, he said, "I'm trying out for Tarzan. They need a Tarzan." And he even fit the bill, you know. He was. Broad shouldered and had a big neck and really tall. He was t- he was a head taller than me. That guy was. And I found out he I didn't. Would. Yeah, he he didn't get the job. It was that big, tall blonde head guy. Mm-hmm. Had long blonde hair. That guy did. About like Ricky's. <laughs> it's at least that long. Bend. There's Tarzan right there. Yeah. Right <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, so, so did you just you just up and left? So what happened? Yeah, we did. Keith left us out there, and, and then uh, so what happened? Then we came in off the road sometime, uh, sometime way after that, but it was still within the year. No, it was sixty four. I started at the beginning of sixty three, and this is the beginning of sixty four. By the time I left here, anyway, I called him up. I called them up out there in California, and they said, yeah, look, bring that guy and come on out, because they had something big they were going to do uh, in a day or two. Mm. And I told Billy, I said, I'm going to go home and get married first before I go out there. <laughs> I said, I'm afraid I'm going to lose her, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> I went home and got married, and, <laughs> and uh, oh, she didn't want to go, you know. But, but uh, And when I did finally get her out there she got so homesick <laughs> she did <laughs> but there at the hotel bill knew that old man that was at the desk uh he knew him real well and i said i'm just gonna give that old man that guitar and he'd put it up and because uh, <laughs> i hated telling bill really and left we did we just left i shouldn't have done that and so i was telling keith that bill keith 
Keith said, well, I didn't give him no notice either. <laughs> did Bill, did Bill, uh, did he hold it against you? He didn't. He might, Evidently, he didn't, because the first time I saw him was when it was back east in June, June or July, I think. He'd come up there, and I remember uh, uh, his boy was playing bass with him. And, uh, oh, James was playing bass? James. Yeah. And, and the guy you just mentioned was playing guitar. Sandy. Sandy. Oh, Sandy Rothman. Yep. He was playing guitar. And, of course, Sandy stayed with us here. We had an apartment out here on the West End. And I asked somebody when I moved here, I, I said, what, do you remember where that place was where we stayed? Yeah, right in the middle of 440. <laughs> 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 and it was a nice place. It was upstairs. Ralph Rensler. Oh, cool. He rented it, you know. He, yeah. He's kind of a business guy. Well, he's managing Bill. He was, he was one of Bill's longest managers. Yeah, He was. Yeah, yeah. I'm so surprised because I know like I, nothing but love and respect, for, of course, for Bill Monroe. But I was always told yeah. he was a man who, who could hold a grudge. I mean, he didn't talk to Earl Scruggs for so long, you know, and Lester Flatt for a long time. I'm surprised he was so cool with you guys leaving the band, you know. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I am too, but you know, we weren't in competition with him. That was it, right? Yeah. I think that was it. It wasn't See, so much that they left, it was that they left and started another... God, and they got good right away, you know, the yeah. Flat and Scruggs, oh didn't God, yeah, But that yeah. Mercury record. And famous. Out. They got famous and <laughs> yeah. got a TV show and all that stuff. Now you bake wine uh-huh. with Martha Quine. Yes, ma'am. Goodness gracious, good and light, Martha Quine. Martha Now you bake better biscuits, cakes, and pie. Call Martha White, say fries and flour. The one all purpose flour. Martha White, say fries and flour. It's got high right. Yeah, and they, what it was, the sponsor of this. The Martha Wade? Yeah. They were sponsoring Flat and Scruggs. Well, they talked to the to the guys up in here, and they said, now we want to get our band on there. Mm-hmm. Our pre- Bill got wind of that, and but he he got he took names and 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 all <laughs> he took Roy Cuff and got people to sign not keep them off of here, you know. Yeah, he didn't want that competition. <laughs> 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 and then they eventually said, "Well, look, if you don't if you don't take our band, we're going to take our sponsorship away." Well, they had to come on here. Yeah, you know? no choice. So uh, listen, you, you've been you nothing but generous, and it, we've already been. You know, I, I don't want to keep you all today. Is what I'm saying. I know you guys got to go on the road, so I'm going to skip ahead a little tiny bit. Okay, I just have a couple of things like. How do you... Because you ended up going home and working a job, right? Yeah, let's see. Went back home. Yeah. You worked we a, started you worked having a, a family. You worked a day job. You worked a... Several different ones, yeah. Uh, I worked for my father-in-law. He had a sawmill, and I worked for him in the woods and, and at the sawmill also. Yeah. And you, and you were able that. you were able to play music as well as... Yeah, I was kind of self-employed the whole time mm-hmm. at things I would do. Mm-hmm. I had a couple jobs where I had to punch a clock, but... I know I worked on a uh, reactor down there on the river. And, uh, no, you know where you've heard of Three Mile Island? Yeah. This is the next one down river, uh, Peach Bottom. I worked there all winter one time, and then I worked. Uh, th- then I finally got a uh, job with uh, my wife's uncle, cutting timber and all like that. And uh, I told him, I said, "Now I play music," which he knew that he liked music too. And he said, "Anytime you gotta go play, just go ahead. Just let me know, you know." And, and so I was fortunate that way and could, I guess I did my first record. A guy heard me when I was with Bill Monroe in uh, Berkeley. We played that festival in Berkeley out there. And, and he come east and he wanted to do a record on me. And so, yeah, I wanted to do a record. She's long, she's tall. She's six feet from the ground. She's long, she's tall, she's six feet from the ground. That was 67 when I did that. Were the boys, like, maybe it's a better question for you, Ronnie, but I'm going to get to you yeah. another time. <laughs> but were, the, were, were, were you teaching the boys how to play, or were you... Well, you know, from what I remember now, Ronnie, may he, he can remember things. I know, uh, in the, well, when I had my band then, like, we were all in our 30s, you know, me and all the boys in the band, and I didn't think about these guys playing, you know. But I had these instruments at home, and naturally, you know, they, they would, when they were, weren't doing something, they would try to play these things, you know. And, and I, just, I might guide them a little bit, you know, tell them 
If they try to do something, I could see where maybe they were missing one thing, and I might show them that and then let them go, you know. Yeah. But it got, got to a place where I thought, I ain't going to fool with them because they're, they got it on their own now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'd rather they had, once they get the basics down, you know, that they play their own way. Yeah. And, and they did. And then they ended up, tell me about the decision to ask the boys. It's kind of cool to have you guys in the room right now for this. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the decision to then ask the boys to be in the band or to you know, start the band with the boys. Like, how did, how did that decision start? Well, let's see. What do you think, guys? <laughs> I'm getting a sense of a hostage situation <laughs> here. Like, you didn't have you didn't have much of a choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 as, as far as me, because I guess I started first in 1981. Yeah, he did. Um, I had been playing the fiddle uh, a little bit, and then I wanted to play the mandolin, and uh, I'd kind of seen, you know, being in being in the uh, family, and when Dad would go play back then, a lot of times the festival was three days, so we would go in the summertime, you know, and spend three days at a festival or something, and the guys in the band had kids our age, we all played around, you know, and did all that stuff, and and then, um, you know, you get kind of bit by the music bug a little bit. And I had seen uh, Marty Stewart when I was pretty young. And he was playing mandolin. And we buddied up a little bit. He's a li lot older than me. I mean, 10 years probably. Yeah. and uh, Or more now. But, there was uh, a guy playing, throwing a football. And he had his yeah. cowboy hat on. Yeah. And he was just a kid. You know, yeah, guess. he was with Lester Flat. Yeah, the Nashville grass. Yeah, and... <laughs> And then uh, I saw this one kind of one thing really clicked seeing Bill Monroe at uh, in Lincoln Center in New York City. I went with Dad and just helped him, supposed to be helping probably sell albums and T-shirts and stuff like that. And But uh, anyhow, I got, got the mandolin and I only had been playing for six months, just kind of chopping chords and learn a few kickoffs and things. And he put me right in. And, like your uh, son was there tonight. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, uh -huh, it was. Yeah, yeah he's he, he's here tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, it was. Uh, like I always say it's sink or swim. You just got to keep keep up with these guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, Rob, he started out of necessity. He was a, playing banjo, but he had to. <laughs> bass player didn't show. <laughs> Classic for the trip. Right. So <laughs> Rob had to. Rob had to, to. He was playing the bass around the house, and he just. Dad said, <laughs> get your suit. <laughs> what, what? He and your white hat. But I remember no. he, <laughs> he, he, he learned to play bass, I guess, from my brother. Oh, yeah, watching. From Jerry. Yeah, watching yeah, Jerry, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, he was just a great bass player. Just being around him, watching him. And, and uh, I guess Jerry, Jerry must have had been playing bass not too long before that. And he left his bass on the bus. Okay. And I went down there and got it. I started thumping around and playing with records, you know. <laughs> and uh, but I had never played. I had never even been in a jam session playing a bass fiddle, you know. Yeah. And because uh, I'd been playing banjo, you know. And uh, I think it was, it was 1986, I believe. Fourth of July weekend, like Ronnie was talking about, Dad was going to Bath, New York, for three days at a festival. Needed a bass player right away. <laughs> so, you had a suit that fit. <laughs> Dad, he said uh, he's got a hold of Ernie Sykes. Ernie could do the two nights, but he he like the two following. We had to leave and play that night up there in New York. I think so. And uh, so I played the first night, and you know that was. I don't know. It was sink or swim for sure. I, you know, I'd I'd played a lot of them songs well, along with the record, I guess. You know, but I did not consider myself a bass player. Right, right, right. <laughs> but he did it. And he did it for a year, didn't he? Yeah, and then uh, after that, after that weekend, I just I kept going out and playing bass. Yeah, right. <laughs> for about a year, and yeah, then the banjo player quit. And then the banjo player quit, <laughs> and then. When uh, when when he left, I told Rob, I said, now you're going to have to play banjo. And I I think that worried him a little because he was getting pretty comfortable on that bass. <laughs> <laughs> but he knew really? how to play banjo. He did. <laughs> I, I enjoyed playing bass. Once I got used to doing it, you know, it's, 
<laughs> well, it's one of them things. I mean, it gets away from you quick, you know, just to – the physical part of playing one of them, you know. <laughs> yeah, right and uh, but I really enjoyed that, and then uh, yeah, then I, well, I've been in the, on the banjo ever since. I oh, guess. Ever since. So, so Dale, like, I, I, we got. I'm, I'm worried they're going to revoke your Opry membership <laughs> if we keep on going. I'm afraid they're going to get they're going to kick us all out, and they're going to, you know, you're going to be back playing, you know, working at the sawmill. Back playing for Bill Monroe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. <laughs> But does it ever does it ever occur to you that what you know what Bill Monroe was to you and so many people? Mm-hmm. I mean, you are to another generation right now. You are sort of the one of the one of the I'll say like one of the last links to the original band of bluegrass music. Do you ever have that moment of realization? Well, you know, I, I guess I just don't think about it that much. You know, I, I yeah, I know that, that that's a fact. You know, and and I'm glad that I was there with him you know and he was the type of guy that he didn't he would never uh, show you anything or tell you anything yeah he just i think he played off of uh, as a lead singer you know i didn't realize it then but i sang lead with him and he would sing to the lead singer you know because he was a tenor singer and 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 i tried to sing to him well and uh, which was probably good it probably worked out good he told me one time he said now now, when you're singing with me, you'll never hear me hit a falsetto note. And uh, I must have had a pretty good ear because I knew exactly when he went in falsetto, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in, in his older days then, it, it showed more, you know, yeah. falsetto. Yeah. It, it yeah. did. But yeah. back then, it, it's true, you know, it, it was hard for me to tell. But, and he he uh, he never told me how to play or, uh, but I... I'd get right in there and work with him, man. Yeah. I would get in there and work hard, you know. And, and, you, and you guys have become this band that has been able to cross over to so many people. Like, you know, I, when I've been a fan of the Del McCurry band for a really long time. And what's always been really remarkable to me is that it's not just nerd like bluegrass nerds like me, you know? And when I see your concerts, I mean, there, there's hippies, there's, you know, stockbrokers, you know, there's people who, you know... Are, you know Jailbirds. Are, jailbirds. <laughs> <laughs> there's people in striped outfits yeah. with a ball attached to their legs. Some the stripes that go around. Yeah, yeah. Holding onto a bag with a dollar sign in it, you know? <laughs> yeah, of course, damn. Who could forget them? Yeah. Uh, but but, it, but then, it, it must be meaningful to be able to... It must be odd at times, but it must be yeah. meaningful to be able to, to look at it, those kind of people, you know. Yeah, I know it. It is, and you know, uh, I, I'll tell you what. We we play places, and people come up and they'll say, you know, we, I've never heard a bluegrass band, you know, and and if that's what you're doing, I, I like what this is, you know. Or they'll say, you know, I've heard of bluegrass before, and I, I I I just didn't like it until I heard you guys. <laughs> Which made us feel good. Why do you think? Why do you think that is? I think it's because you, you, you. I don't know. You play it pretty straight. I mean, you do. I guess so. But you don't. I mean, you do all kinds of weird songs and folk songs and political songs and Woody Guthrie songs and all this other yeah. stuff. But uh-huh. but it feel, it always feels like bluegrass to me. It always feels to me that what you're doing is is not disconnected from what you did with in the early days. You know. Yeah, really. It's it's right. You know. And on shows we do requests. You know, a, a lot a lot of it is requests. Once the each member does something, you know, like play or sing something, you know. Or we'll we'll do do requests and then try to get some of the songs that we that maybe on the latest record in the show or whatever, you know. But but you're you're kind of a, you're kind of also this jukebox in some ways for the for like for, for, for <laughs> like I just know when I go to see you I can't wait to hear a Del McCurry song and I can't wait to hear you sing Body and Soul. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I can't yeah, wait. Yeah. I can't. I can't wait for that. You know. I know. It. Yeah. Yeah. And then the Travel and Curry's doing so well. You must be very proud. I really am. Yeah. We, we got to thinking. Me and my wife and my manager. You know, uh, we knew that if anything ever happened to me, you know, which I'm 80 now, and when I was 70, I guess that's about when it all started, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, we thought, you know, if if anything ever happened to me. Uh, they'd have to start over, you know, and if we, so Stan, my manager, he said, look, we'll get them a booking agent, their own agent, and uh, man, it was no time to lay, we're working a lot, and they had, to, they got their own material, you know, their own song. You keep me up just one more night, I can't sleep here no more, Little up in Fox's quarter to eight, you kept me I 
it weird for you? Have you ever seen them? Is it weird for you to be in the audience watching your band? And well, it is, you know. Yeah, but I really enjoy it. I really do that. They're, they're good. They are, man. They really I know are. they're in the room right now, but they're good. They really are. They're great yeah. Band, yeah. And they got a better guitar player than I am. <laughs> <laughs> he I is good. I, don't believe that. I just saw him a minute ago playing yeah. with Ricky up there. Yeah. And then, so I'll, I'll close off as we as we began. Okay. You know, we t- we started by talking about you, your dad taking a battery out of the car so we could put it into a radio so he could listen to the Opry, and then you get yeah. inducted into the Opry in two thousand three. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of full circle. What does what does that mean to you? <laughs> yeah, it's really something. You know, I was so excited. I did, and when that happened, because because I'd listened to it so long, and it was in my mind, it was a, such a big thing, and and really, uh, even yet, you know, if I'm going to forget words to a song, it'll be out on that stage, you know. You still get nervous, Hank? Huh? Yeah, I do. Uh, some nights is n- not near as bad as others, but but uh, it'll make me forget words, you know. But then, then there's also something else that causes that. When you do the Opry, just like now tonight, we did three songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if it's on the weekend, it's usually two. And uh, when you play a show, you go out there and you warm up with a certain song, and, and then you work into all these other songs that you do, you know, requests or whatever. Where here, you just go out there cold, and, and it's different. Yeah, by the time you're done, you're warmed up. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> by the time you're well, done, by the time you're warmed up, you're done. <laughs> yeah, right. And you could then you could go right on with it if, <laughs> when you're walking off. <laughs> we could play all night, man, in the dressing room if you want. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's true. It it it, uh, it excites me to play the opera, you know. Uh, and when I was with Bill, the first night I did the opera with Bill, I wasn't in the union. So in this local, I was in a union in a local, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't uh, what you call recognize it. Yeah. So uh, Bill said, "Now, now, I want you to do the Opry with me. That first time we come back off the road." But he said, "You can't play, but I want you to sing whatever it was." I sang a couple of songs with him, and he got another guitar player that's on here. And I just stood there and sung, and I, man, I felt that makes it worse. You stand there, you know what to do. Your hands, you know, you don't know where to put them. <laughs> I would have felt a lot more at ease if I could have had a guitar when I walked up there with him, you know. But you weren't in the union. <laughs> but then he got me in the next week. Mm-hmm. He took me down there and got me in this local. And Keith, he got Keith in quicker. He did a record as soon as... He wanted to cut all those instrumentals. Sailor's Horn, Pipe, Devil's Dream, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah he wanted to do all those while he had Keith you here. You were in the studio with him. Yeah, I was in the studio, uh, but I wasn't in the union. That's right, I wasn't in the union then. Uh, or I could have played on them. So you just That's had to right. watch your band. Again, you had to watch your band. <laughs> yeah, I had just had to sit oh, there. On a, I remember it was a tall stool or something. I sat there and watched them. And, and Bill came over to me one time. He said, uh, you got to pick. And I said, yeah, I did. I had one in my pocket. And I pulled it out, and, and I let him have it. And he looked at it, and I said, is that all right? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want you to play. <laughs> no. He just wanted to see the pick. <laughs> he yeah. just, he, he just want, and he took, it, he took my pick and played with it. Then. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I don't know what was wrong with his. Oh, man. <laughs> well, listen, it's been so great to talk to you, and thanks for making the time. Uh, and thanks for all your music, man. Like oh, yeah. When we had this idea to speak to legends of bluegrass music, you were the first name that came up. Oh, really? So we had, we had to make sure we talked to you. And thanks to the boys for, for sitting around, too. <laughs> yeah, and, appreciate and it. And helping me out. Yeah. It was a pleasure, man. Pleasure. I've been burning. I've been wearing out these tires I got a rebuilt carburetor I've got brand new spark plug wires I've been clutching and a-breaking I've been up these hills and down and that is it for the show. Uh, thanks so much to Del McCurry. Thanks so much to Ronnie and Rob McCurry. Thanks to everybody at the Opry House, home of the Grand Ole Opry. Um, I, I really loved that. And I think once you got past me nervously laughing in a I can't believe I'm here kind of way, it went pretty well. Over the next few weeks, you're going to hear me uh, talk to incredible bluegrass musicians, people who helped uh, create, grow, and change this music. Folks like Alice Gerard, Bela Fleck, Jerry Douglas, and so many more, including uh, two weeks from now, my conversation with Ricky Skaggs, who is an icon of this music and someone who, like Del McCurry, got a lot of people into this music. But I think once you drill down, what's interesting about him is that he was a child prodigy. And like with any child prodigy, life is complicated. 
So I'm excited to talk to him about that. If you want to dig into more Del McCurry content, go to thebluegrasssituation.com where you can find an essential Del McCurry playlist, multiple interviews, and even a very special video session from 2013 with Del and Sam Bush. Del actually plays banjo, which is interesting because we talked about him playing banjo. And if you want more podcasts like Toy Heart, check out all the shows on the BGS Podcast Network, like Show on the Road and The Breakdown, which is back with all new episodes for season two. Toy Heart is co-produced by me, Tom Power, and Stephanie Coleman. Our executive producer is Amy Reitenauer-Jacobs, uh, with help, as always, from the entire BGS team, including producer Chris Jacobs, associate editor Justin Hiltner, managing editor Craig Shelburne, and all of the amazing writers and contributors that make the BGS the best source for roots culture redefined. You can discover more at thebluegrasssituation.com. Thanks also to Mike Laval for additional audio production, and to Chris Critter Eldridge and Kristen Andreasen for their music and the theme, which is a version of Bill Monroe's song, Toy Heart. Darling, you toyed with a toy heart. Don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you know someone in your life who's interested in roots music or bluegrass music, uh, send this to them. Make sure they hit subscribe, too. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to get in touch with us, we are at Toy Heart Podcast on Instagram. You can also go to our website, uh, toyheartpodcast.com, which redirects to the Bluegrass Situation site where you can find this podcast. If you want to get in touch with me for whatever reason, uh, I'm at Tom Joe Power. All right, we'll see you for Ricky Skaggs later on. Mm-hmm.